And so this is a webinar which will be covering the six essential elements of a winning independent retail strategy. And if you've been present in one of these previous webinars in this series, you'll know that Paul Erickson from Management One is our presenter. This webinar is related to a service that is available through Retail Pro, which is called Retail Pro Planning. Now this is an open to buy service that utilizes Retail Pro Planning software that's integrated with Retail Pro and also includes consultation from a Management One retail and inventory expert, such as Paul Erickson. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce Paul Erickson of Management One to get us started here. Great. Thanks, Dustin, and good morning, everybody. Um, everybody put their seatbelts on. Uh, there's going to be a lot of information that we're going to cover over the next 45 to 50 minutes. On, um, on creating a winning independent retail strategy. Uh, this is Paul Erickson. I am the uh, Director of Sales and Marketing for Management One and Retail Pro Planning. And we would love to chat with you at some point if you're at all interested in how we uh, are benefiting literally thousands of retailers across the globe uh, with our consulting and um, our open to buy planning service and products. All right, let's get started. Let's talk about uh, uh, the elephant in the room, um, Amazon. Um, I consider Amazon today the catch-all excuse for all manner of retail woes in the United States and literally now around the globe. It's frictionless e-commerce, one-click shopping. Amazon makes money on its web servers, which power e-commerce, as well as its retail uh, online business. But despite all the accolades, and the achievements. There are still some adjectives you never you never hear in a sentence when people talk about Amazon, like fun, uh, beautiful, joyous. You never hear them, never hear Amazon described in those terms. And the reason is, Amazon isn't fun. People don't meet for dinner and then go on an Amazon shopping spree. You know, taking selfies of each other, whether on the computer, it certainly isn't beautiful. Amazon is about as aesthetically pleasing as a wood chipper. It is built for one thing and one thing only, efficiency and volume. Because Jeff Bezos never set out to create a delightful shopping experience. Amazon is just simply the shortest distance between wanting something and getting something. And the narrative today in retail is that a lot of the retail woes that we see with some of the major retailers throughout North America uh, are because of the Amazon effect. Well, I'm going to take a little bit different approach to that narrative. Because nearly every chain that's been caught up over the last several years in the brick-and-mortar meltdown really has very little to do with Amazon, and it has more to do with the fact that they're all leveraged buyout queens, as I call them. Leveraged buyouts by private equity firms during the, uh, uh, the LBL boom uh, with ultra-cheap money. These private equity firms use very little of their capital, but they have bought these companies from debt the retailer itself has to issue to fund the buyout, which leaves these retailers highly leveraged. Then the private equity firm issues even more junk bonds or leverage loans to fund dividends back to the private equity firm because if you know anything about private equity firms, hell or high water, they get their money. And then they charge the retailer on top of that hefty management fees on an ongoing basis. Now this is called asset stripping and heavy debt. And this works wonderfully until it doesn't. Since 2010, retail chains owned by private equity firms have issued $91 billion in junk bonds and leverage loans. And this all worked great until brick and mortar business became more difficult in 2015. And this has been the problem and this is the reason essentially why we see the stores closing around the US. So oftentimes retailers ask me, and this is good for me, how? Well, start out with the fact that these large companies are weakened financially. These large companies are very risk averse with inventory today and we have way too many stores. There's 46 square foot of selling space for every man, woman, and child in the United States of America. Now let's compare that with some, some other parts of the globe. Uh, the next highest concentration of, 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 of retail selling space is in Australia. 22 square feet for every man, woman, and child. In Europe, 20 square feet. In Canada, five. Simply put, one of the reasons why we're losing stores is that we have too many. 
And as these chains continue to shed locations, we're, going to, we're looking at retail rents starting to go down simply through the law of supply and demand. And one other thing, too, about retail. People still love the experience of shopping in a store. 90% of consumers in a recent survey said they still love to shop in stores, but the sameness of the chains has turned them off. Retail is the economic engine of the United States, and 60% of all retailers in the United States are small. They have four employees or less. So how do we compete going forward in this changing environment? Well, I've come up with six very, very uh, important uh, rules or steps uh, that we need to be aware of to be competitive and to thrive in retail going forward. And we're going to start with the first one, which is attention. That is the most precious resource of your customers, and we need to seize it. We are constantly looking down at our phones. We are not paying attention. Sometimes you walk in, you look into a mall, and it's like the it's like the night of the Walking Dead. Everybody staring at their phones, glassy-eyed, not looking back and forth, not looking, not window shopping. And so how do we attract our clients' attention? Well, let me tell you a couple of true stories. The first is about actually a store in Barcelona, Spain, and that is the store Sneakers & Company. And when I was in Barcelona, Spain several years ago with my wife, we were having coffee and, uh, in the old quarter, and I saw this store. And this is a picture of it called Sneakers and & Company. And it reminded me about how our, the consumer acquires products, but the consumer invests emotionally in stores. And I was intrigued by the chalkboard that you see uh, on this picture about, uh, about sneakers and they're part of our lives, they're part of our history. And over to the right, you will see what the sneakers are made of. There were, I think you probably can't read it on this particular uh, photo, but they say uh, our sneakers are 20 grams of fashion, 18 grams of sport, 16 grams of tradition, and it goes on on what the sneakers are made of. So curious, I walked in the store. And the woman, There was a woman there, and uh, she spoke English. And I said, what does the grams mean? And I really like your messaging on the outside of the store, but I don't understand how it's 12 grams of sport and all that. And what she told me was that those, that sign means absolutely nothing. It's essentially there to, to bring people in the store. And then she looked at me and she said, and here you are. It worked. It got my attention. We have a client in Toronto, Canada called Blazers for Men. And Blazer for Men, several years ago, decided to take out all the window dressing, take out all the mannequins, take out all the apparel in, uh, in his windows because essentially his store, this is an actual picture of his store, his store had very little walk-by traffic, but it had a lot of, of, of car traffic. And so he felt like no one was noticing him. And so instead of having the window trimmer come in three or four times a year and paying that, having, having some of the apparel be sun damaged and having that as a, as a, as a write-off, he decided to put put um, monitors, flat screen monitors in his windows with video content that all his suppliers uh, gave him. That's not a picture that you're looking at. That's actually a video running. And these videos run 24 seven. That, that system was installed in July. We thought it would improve sales and we would probably pay it off within 24 months. The entire system was paid off in six months by the end of December. That the, the, the sales were up from July through December that season. 22%. With no other factor that would produce that kind of increase in revenue on a legacy store that had been there over 20 years, other than he was noticed. And customers would come in and ask him if the store had just opened, if there's new, it's a great store. And it worked. And the reason why it worked is, again, he seized the attention of the traffic going by his store. Now, my daughter lives in Philadelphia, and when I was in Philadelphia this spring, I walked by, I, I drove by a, a sign that says, I hate Steven Singer. I turned to my daughter as we were coming in from the airport, and I said, um, uh, that, must be a, that must have been a bad breakup. <laughs> she, she took out a billboard and, and has a website that says uh, www.ihatestevensinger.com. Oh, and she is one mad ex-wife. And, and my daughter laughed, and she said, no, that's a, that's a jeweler. That's a jeweler in town in the city of brotherly love. 
And the I hate campaign is a classic attention getter. As is Steven Singer himself, by the way. He's a regular on radio stations in Philadelphia and Boston, and he's on the Howard Stern Show. There's actually a NASCAR uh, driven by Mike Wallace that's endorsed by Steven Singer, a jeweler, an independent one-store operation. But why all the hate for our guy Steven? I mean, 20 years ago, uh, the story goes that a guy proposes to his girlfriend with a gorgeous diamond ring from Steven Singer, and naturally, yes, uh, 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 20 years later, he buys her another ring for their 20th anniversary. Well, she was so excited, he even got a bigger present hint him to nine months later. But this is the story on the website. The couple walks through the door to show Steven Singer their new baby. And the wife proclaimed, I love Steven Singer. And the husband says, here we go again, up all night with feedings and diaper changes. I hate Steven Singer. And there you go. That is, I don't have no idea if that's a true story or not. But it gets noticed. It's different. It's a classic campaign of grabbing attention. You know, when I was on my way to Barcelona a couple of years ago to give speeches, um, I was changing planes at JFK. And I was in the Delta Club, and I was sitting next to me at the bar was a gentleman who worked for McDonald's. And we asked, he asked me what I did for a living, and I told him that I worked with retailers. And he told me that he was uh, 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 part of the European operations at McDonald's. He said in Europe. And we had a very nice chat, and he was a super guy. And then he asked me the question. He said, what do you think? I'd be interested to know, what do you think is our McDonald's hamburgers? What is our core competency as a company? What would you think it would be? Me, being the idiot that I am, said, well, I'm thinking probably French fries. And he laughed, and he goes, no, what we believe we are better than every one of our competitors is site selection. We have we know how to pick the right sites for our franchisees. We know that site selection and being visible and being noticed is everything. And we believe that is our core competency. And you know, ever since that conversation that I had with that gentleman, every time I drive around the United States, I see the golden arches from far away. They're very, very noticeable. They get my attention. And I'm always reminded of that sharing that cocktail with the gentleman from McDonald's. You know, getting attention is not just outside the store, it's inside the store too. How you message to your customers inside the store, giving them the messaging of the merchandise is really, really important. IKEA, I think, is very, very good because they're not selling just pots and pans here. These are durable, these are versatile, and these makes cooking fun 365 days a year. I don't think anybody does it better than Duluth Trading Company. They might be the hottest retailer, the fastest growing retailer in the United States today. And Duluth Trading Company, when you go in their stores, not only do their ads and their commercials are hilarious and funny and get attention, but when uh, you go in the store, they, don't, they sell outdoor and work clothing, not the most exciting merchandise. But when you go and look at the merchandise, they will tell you exactly why those work pants are worth what they are and how they're made, and give it value through messaging. They use humor. They don't tell just jeans. They, they call their jeans ballroom jeans, and it's the crouch without the ouch. And it's not just a Henley shirt that they sell. It's a Don Henley shirt that they sell. It's the Eagles. Let's take it easy. Always tell your customers to grab their attention when they're in your store when something's new. Don't be afraid to say new arrivals. It's like a new car. Tell them when it comes in and tell them that this is brand new merchandise. Customers are attracted to that. But they, you know it's new, but not always they know it's new. And by the way, you know, I was in, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I was in uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania several years ago, and I was in the bookstore at Gettysburg College. And it was funny, we walked around the store with the, with the uh, manager and the director, and he had these things called Tammy's Picks on merchandise. Tammy's Picks here, Tammy's Picks on another rack over there. And finally, I saw about three or four of these areas of the store where it said, Tammy approves this merchandise, Tammy's Picks. And I asked the, the, the director, I said, is Tammy one of your buyers? Does she work here in the store? He laughed. He goes, oh, no, Tammy. Tammy was a student that left 10 years ago. She has, a, I don't know where Tammy is right now in the United States. But we continually tell people that Tammy loves this rack, this merchandise that just came in. And Tammy doesn't even exist. 
But this gets back to the fact that we are all underconfident. We all want to know what other people's opinion is. We all need that. And being able to give little clues in your store that this is new, that this is great, that I love this item, is very, very important. Now, the second step is simplicity. Because today, simplicity is so important. Simplicity in everything we do, from our presentations, our messages, our windows, everything that you do that the customer sees must be simple. That is absolutely critical today because clutter shuts down consumers' senses. You know, there was a book written several years ago called The Paradox of Choice by Larry Schwartz. And in Larry Schwartz's book, he maintains that given too many choices, humans will simply not be able to choose. Now, there have been many experiments that have proven this to be true. And one of the experiments was simply my life. I have two young daughters, and when they were young, they, when I would take them to an ice cream parlor to torture them. That's right, that's what I would do. Because it had so many flavors that having to make a choice, uh, that was the one thing they hated. And I asked them, why does it take so long to make a choice when there's 50 flavors to pick from? And they told me, they said, well, we think we are, we're always worried that we're not going to pick the right one. Fear is whichever they choose, there's another option that's better. Basic human psychology when you give someone too many choices. Now, I think the best study of this of all time was two years ago, Princeton University did a very famous study, uh, and they went out to California and participated in a California gourmet farmer's market. Where were there, the, 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 the assistants to the professor set up a booth of samples every weekend of Wilkin and Son jams, which are uh, expensive jams out of the United Kingdom. And what they did was every few hours, they switched from offering selection of 24 jam flavors to a group of six jam flavors. And the results are really, really interesting. And this lasted the entire summer. On the average, it didn't matter whether there were 24 flavors to pick from at, at their table or six. On the average, the consumer that would stop by would taste two regardless of assortment size. And also, this was also a result, when they had more uh, flavors to pick from, 24, 60% of the stop, of the, uh, the people that stopped stopped when there were more flavors, 24. 40% of the of people that stopped stopped when there were six. But here's the key. 30% who sampled from the smaller assortment bought while only 3% confronted with 24 jams to pick from bought. Let me say that again. 30% purchased jam when there were only 6 to pick from. 3% purchased when there were 24. The presence of too many choices may seem appealing as theory, but actually if you give your customer too much to pick from, that proves to be debilitating for the consumer. Now, another step three, another very important factor today is, is really, I'll put these two together, it's stressing local. People like to buy local, and they also like it when you, when you create promotions around charities, cause marketing, because local interest and local history is very, very important, and there are many, many uh, things that have happened over the last few years that prove that. We just have a new store. I live in the Twin Cities in, <clears throat> in Rosedale Mall. Um, a new uh, store opened up called Rose and Loon. And Rose and Loon departs from expensive. It's hardly anything there that sells for more than $300. And a lot of everything is made from locally made artisans and, and makers. Uh, they sell caramels, for example, what they made for 59 cents. But it is another homage to buy local. But it turns the concept on its head by avoiding some mistakes made by other local artisan shops. First, the store sells items not seen anywhere else. Too often, locally focused gift shops bring in merchandise similar to commercially made products, but not here. It makes Rosenlund mixes it up with wood product, pottery, jewelry, glassware, aromatherapy, gourmet snacks, 
tote bags. It's a really fun store, and the artisans are actually there on the weekends. They spend time in the store to answer questions and even demonstrate their craft because a large amount of the store space is devoted to craft tables, very suitable for demonstrations and for actual craft classes, local. Now, Herberger's, which is, may they rest in peace, part of the Bonton chain, which we know closed, but several years ago, Herberger's decided that they would begin an initiative that during the holidays on buying, on buying local, doing things in Minnesota, things from Minnesota to take up to the cabin. You can kind of see from this picture the display they had. You know, the initiative started as a way to keep the store's brand regional. And it didn't really have any set sales goals. They didn't think it would be much more than a million dollars in sales the first year in all their stores in Minnesota. And they had apparel and glassware and blankets and jewelry and handbag scarves and the list goes on candles. Sales that holiday season, while they thought they would do less than a million dollars, were $10 million. People loved it. They liked to buy local. I love to talk about the Salmon Sisters. That's right, that's them. And yes, their name is Salmon. And yes, they are from Homer, Alaska. And their stuff sells like hotcakes in stores throughout Alaska. And they sell tchotchkes, they sell uh, t-shirts, they sell coffee mugs, as you can see. They actually were in a commercial recently for, I think, Microsoft. They're local. They're from Alaska. They grew up on a fishing boat with their dad. And when you buy anything from Salmon Sisters, they will donate a can of wild salmon to the Alaska Food Bank. They are now taking the local aspect and merging it with a very, very important other aspect, which is cause marketing. We had a client here in Minneapolis who uh, decided that they would park a taco truck outside of their store in downtown Minneapolis, and that weekend, they would do, they would donate 10% of all sales to the Make-A-Wish Foundation here in Minnesota. It's a great foundation. It's a great charity, and they and the tacos were awesome too. And they did more business that weekend than they would do in two weeks. It was a huge success. There's a store in Victoria, British Columbia, called Outlooks for Men. Several years ago. Uh, Dale Olson, the owner, started a fashion show. But this was a unique fashion show, and it was around cause marketing. All of the all of the sales that evening uh, would go to would go to the prevention of cruelty to animals, and and everyone in the fashion show, the men that he would invited in, all local celebrities in the Victoria, BC area, all brought their dogs, and the dogs would go up and down the the, the runway with them. These were their dogs. And the other thing they had in common, every one of their dogs were rescue dogs. So you can see in the picture here that you've got a gentleman here on the left who's the artistic director of the ballet in Victoria. All of these people are known kind of local celebrities who participate in this event. And it has become the event in Victoria every single year. When Dale started this, his store was doing very little volume and he needed to get his customers' attention, and he got it. Today, the store does several million dollars in business, and this is one of the reasons why is what he has been doing, this cause fashion show with animals, and that's Dale on the right with his dogs. Now, step four is, and people talk about it all the time, is customer service, providing legendary customer service, because shoppers today are tired of being considered these faceless numbers in a crowd. You can go into some of these big chain stores, you're not even greeted. They are willing to pay for a better service. In fact, a recent survey showed that two-thirds of Americans spend actually 14% more with a company they believe delivers excellent service. One of the retailers that has really grabbed onto that is Saks Fifth Avenue. Saks is taking a very aggressive lead that other luxury retailers now have to follow. They call it the Sack Save Me Service, which lets shoppers call a dedicated number to resolve, shall we say, fashion emergencies within 24 hours. And it's in 15 U.S. markets. And if, let's say you're traveling to New York on a business trip and they lost your bags or you spilled coffee on the plane. Well, they will then send a wardrobe band to your hotel. They'll know your sizes. They'll know the brands and the designers you like. They'll all be in the van, and you can go in and, and, and purchase it right outside the hotel. 
Buying clothes at Saks for preferred customers might also mean a chauffeured ride home in a BMW. Uh, credit card holders can access 24-hour concierge service to book travel theater tickets. But what this really means is that they are keeping their customers feeling valued and pampered. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever uh, uh, flew on Singapore Airlines business class or uh, Emirates business class, but if you have n not, don't. Because if you fly in some of these great Asian carriers business class, you'll never want to fly any other way again. It's absolutely amazing. I fly Delta because I live in Minneapolis. And several years ago, I was flying into Atlanta, and I was changing planes to go to the Caribbean to see a client. As my plane, this is actually a picture that I took. As my plane came up to the, to the jetway, I look out and I see a white Porsche right out on the tarmac. My first thought is, boy, the baggage handlers really had a good deal with Delta on this last series of negotiations. But as I walked off the plane, there was a gentleman standing in the jetway with, this, with, a, with a suit on and tie, and he said, Mr. Mr. Erickson, Paul Erickson, I go, that's me. And he goes, do you have all your bags? And I said, I do. And I and the other gentleman who you see in the picture, he took us down the jetway, put our bags in the Porsche, and this is a true story, he drove us because we had tight connections. And Atlanta is a very big airport to our connecting gate in a Porsche. That's customer service. Now, the end of the story is two months later, I'm on the same flight. We go into Atlanta, look out the window, no Porsche. But it did happen, and this is how our customers are judging us because our customers see this treatment. Our customers know that other service providers, other retailers, provide this kind of service and this kind of treatment and this kind of pampering. And we live in this environment because our customers – Compare their experience in our store horizontally, not vertically. What do I mean by that? They are not necessarily comparing their experience in your store with your, your, your direct competitors, but they are comparing the experience that you give them in your store with every other service provider and retailer they've been exposed to in the last six months. And that's daunting, but that's a fact. And what are they looking for today? Well, a couple of things, and this has to do with, again, human psychology. Guarantees and easy returns today are uppermost in our consumers' minds. Because in human psychology, humans expend twice as much energy to avoid a loss as they will to gain a win. We hate losing, and we will reward companies who minimize that feeling for us. I, don't, I think the best example of all that I could give you is Zappos, to see how loyal customers can be if a brand convinces them that they cannot make a mistake thanks to Zappos' liberal return policies. You know, you know what a smart guy I am. When I heard that Zappos was, this was before they were owned by Amazon, and I said, selling shoes online, I don't think that's going to work. You know, you got to try them on. Every company's a little bit different fit. You know, the people want to walk around in the shoes to see if they're comfortable. That's how much I knew. Customers return up to 50% of their orders at Zappos. But they're also very, very profitable. And they built a brand around you can't lose. Now, here's a very, very attractive sign you might see in some stores. That's a real welcoming, I want to shop here. Let's talk about returning stuff. This was a study done last year. Last year, returns, by the way, in the United States uh, hit two hundred eighty-four billion dollars. That was up six point two percent from the year before. But always remember that online returns are a whopping one third of purchases. So, as online business continues to have a greater share of overall retail sales, you're going to see returns go up because of the nature of online business. Now, thirty to ninety-day return policies are very common now. So, why make it easier for your customers to take something back? Well, in a recent Journal of Retail article, a study, they found that a store's return policy makes a difference in a very surprising way. The longer a store allows the consumer to return something, the less likely 
they are to actually return it. In the stores that took part of the survey, which loosened up their return policy to literally you can bring it back uh, 10 years from now, there was no timeline. What they found is that those retailers' sales went up, but the surprising results, returns went down. If you give them a deadline, and I think anybody who's worked for a school newspaper knows this, if you give them a deadline, then they are, uh, they are more likely to return it. But something far off becomes more abstract. Something closer becomes more concrete and changes your subsequent action. Now, there's also a thing in human psychology called the endowment effect, which essentially says the longer you own something, well, the more it starts to feel like it's really yours, the longer it sits in your closet. And plus, there's one other thing too. It is in our nature as humans that we don't like to return things. Are there people that abuse it? Yes. But most of us don't like to return things because it's sort of like admitting failure. Now, I think Nordstrom deals with this very, very well uh, in their policy. Our philosophy is to deal with you fairly and reasonably, and we hope you will be fair and reasonable with us. You can fire customers if they are abusing your return policy. But, you know, people are going to steal from you as well. And you could stop, see it, stop any theft in its tracks by putting all your merchandise behind glass and have it locked. And anytime you wanted to see anything, you'd have to find a salesperson. They'd unlock the glass and let you look at it while they hover around you. Your, your, your shrinkage would go to zero. Your sales would be down 50%. But you would stop shrinkage. The same is true, I think, with return policies. And by the way, Nordstrom, God love them. They're starting now on the second floor to put martini bars on the second floor. And I think we will finally find out what I've always felt was true for many, many years. People will buy more merchandise when they're drunk. Now, step five, your salespeople. Research has shown that, uh, that even after researching online, comparing prices, reading reviews, all the things that people do today, 40% of the customers in these surveys say they're, they're open to persuasion once they enter your store. Now think about that. That's 40% that admit you could talk me into something. I think the number's probably higher. Those are just the people that admit, yeah, I could, you could probably talk me into that. A well-trained, empowered sales staff determines your level of sales and your level of success. And without them, your store simply cannot perform. You know, Apple is great. Apple's, uh, Apple employees are taught to address customers' needs, how to handle, handle difficult situations, how to create the right environment. Because literally in Apple, the merchandise kind of sells itself. And then they have these mobile solutions that can put really important product information in the hands of their sales associates. And, and consumers value product knowledge above all other services from any sales associate. And plus, I love mobile checkout because that can help sales associates close the sale regardless where they are in the store, and it avoids the number one complaint that consumers have of being in a brick-and-mortar store, which is standing in line waiting for checkout. Now, I don't know how many of you have been in the container store, but the first time I went into a container store, I never, I, I, I never knew how disorganized I really was. But the container store is a really interesting operation because they ask the question in retail, would you rather have three mediocre, ordinary employees or one phenomenal employee? What's better? Well, the container says one because everyone would pick one. Instead of having two people make $20,000 mediocre, they offer $40,000 to an excellent employee, and they still save money. And that's the logic in running the container store. Last year, the average salary for a container store employee, and by the way, that salary, that commission, $44,000. They spend, an average employee uh, spends 187 clock hours of learning how to sell, interface, and amaze their customers. And their credo is that the consumer, the customer, is not number one. The number one person on their, uh, on their hierarchy chart is not the customer, but is the employee. Because if our employees can be that good, then the, think of what they're going to do with our customers. And that's the secret to great retail. And that's the, that's, that is what 
um, the container store does, the ability to motivate their staff. And you cannot recruit, by the way, one of their employees. And you can tell when you go in the store. They rarely have sales. They rarely have deal deals. They're pretty much full price day in and day out. Now, Rich Carlton is raising the bar with their employees. At the Rich Carlton, every employee from the made up has a yearly $5,000 to comp guests. In other words, if the, it's the cabana boy, it's the bartender, it's the maid, it's the waitress, whatever, if there's a problem in the property by one of the guests and that employee knows it was Rich Carlton's fault, they don't have to go, let me go check with my manager and we'll see if we can't take that off your bill. No, they will do it on the spot. And the only question asked by Rich Carlton management is, what happened, and let's make sure that doesn't happen again. And the reason why they do that is they trust their people. You know, leading and motivating our staffs are incredibly important. And one of the things that is so, so important is when we catch somebody doing something right, we should praise, rewarding good behavior. Praise, praise, praise. Praise is the breakfast of champions. Praise behaviors, reward good behaviors, because what gets rewarded gets done. And always remember this, retail is a team sport. Reward the team as much as you can. And I hope not, I hope you use sales associates as titles. I hope no one on this call calls their people clerks, because you know what that rhymes with. And big personality is the key. Big personality. Look for people uh, the, uh, that have big personalities, because people like to buy from people they like and people also support what they help create you know we're seeing more and more retailers starting to put in the suggest the age-old suggestion box in their stores actually Walmart put it in several years ago and the first year they had one suggestion that actually netted them I think they saved 30 million dollars and it was simply someone in one of their stores say why do we have the vending machines on every night and using electricity probably not a big deal for one store but if you multiply it by several thousand and so that went to Bentonville. They looked it up, and they decided that was a good idea by one employee in one store. They turned off, and they saved $30 million in electricity. We should spend one lunch per month with our staff and do one thing and one thing only. Shut up and listen. Listen to what they have to say. Understand what they have to say. Empower them to make decisions and teach them empathy for the customers. And the final of the six steps is managing our inventory. Because all the good retailers know that, that we've got to keep the inventory moving to keep customers coming back and ensure good cash flow, to be financially relevant. And we know that relying too much on deep discounts to move old inventory can hurt our profits, and it will train our customers to wait for the sale. Because the new financial reality today is we have to be profitable. And it has to be cash profits, not paper profits. Too many retailers show too much profit on paper, which they pay a tax on, but don't have the cash flow to support it. Because inventory is the heart of a retail store. At Management One and at Retail Pro Planning, it's very, very common for us to walk into a store and talk to a retailer that's getting two turns a year on their inventory. Two turns, which means that that, in, that, that retailer is carrying at least six months worth of product at any given period of time over the past year. And that's too much inventory. And that is the cause of cash flow problems. And that can be the cause of retail failure. So if two turns, and so how do you determine what your turn rate should be? In fact, how do you determine how much you should be investing in your store's inventory? How do you determine inventory levels? Let's go through with a very short and quick exercise to explain exactly how I think we can get in trouble as retailers with inventory. <clears throat> So let's say I have a pen store and all I sell are pens. That's it. And I know for a fact that I'm going to sell 12 pens this month. I've got a great forecasting tool. I use Retail Pro Planning. Well, how many pens do I need to have in stock to be in the perfect condition of inventory to sell 12? Now, I ask this question at seminars all over the world, and I get a, a, a surprising amount of responses. Some people will say 12. Some people will say 30. Some people, one person said one and then reorder it quickly. But, you know, if, you, if you're going to sell 12, you really only need 12, correct? 
But where the problems come in is if the pen comes in 12 colors, and if it comes in 12 colors, and I know that every one of my customers that come into my pen store this month is going to be emotionally attached to one color. I just don't know which one. So now how many pens do I need? Well, I would need 144. Oh, one other thing too. The pen comes in a longer length and a shorter length. It comes in two different sizes. And each length comes in 12 colors. So to cover my bases, how many am I going to need? Well, 288. How many am I going to sell? 12. That is the cause of inventory problems. That's called just in case inventory management, not just in time. The reason why we're looking at a, a, a calendar book on this screen is that the most important element for being profitable to growing your business to cutting your markdowns, growing your sales, the most important part of inventory control is one word, and that word is not margin, but that word is time. How do we determine how many pens we'll have? We determine that based on how much inventory we want to keep in the store based on time. When I ask a retailer how much inventory they have, many times they'll tell me, the quantity and cost dollars or retail dollars or SKUs or units or case packs or dozens. But the really good retailers who know how to manage their inventory and manage their cash flow will not tell me how much they have in those in those terms, but they will say, you know, right now I have about a three month supply. And I try to keep about a two or three month supply all the time. Those are retailers that understand retail. Because this is a business of time. Let me explain why. Let's say there are 52 weeks in a year. Let's talk about two turns for a second. Two turns is a 26-week supply. In other words, if you're getting two turns in a category or store, you're selling your inventory twice a year, that means it takes you 26 weeks to get your money back. So what would that look like today? Today's December 12th. On a two-turn category, something that arrives today, December 12th, will not be sold this month, will not be sold in January, will not be sold in February, will not be sold in March, will not be sold in April, will not be sold in May. In fact, something that arrives today will not be sold on average until June 12, 2019. That's how, much you, uh, that's how long you tie up your money. And by the way, that's at any price, markdown or full price. It's a long time. Now, a very important metric to understand, and it gets back to time, this is based on about 55% cost of goods sold. But for every week, we can improve our annual sell-through. That would represent an increase in our cash on hand by approximately 1% of annual sales. So let's just take a store that does $2 million in sales. And let's say we go from 26 weeks to having better planning, to taking markdowns when we should, to getting the inventory in and out a little bit faster, 25 weeks, which is 2.08 turns. So essentially that means the item that comes in today won't set, will sell on June 7th. If it's a $2 million retailer, you just increase your cash on hand by $20,000. If we can go to 24 weeks, which is still 2.16 turns, that item that came in today gets sold on May 29th. You just increased your cash on hand by $40,000. And let's say 23 weeks, 2.26. It makes these ratios seem more real when you when you tie it to time. The thing that came in today is sold on May 22nd from today to May 22nd. If we improve that from 26 to 23 weeks, that $2 million retailer just increased its cash on hand by $60,000. Now, back in the 40s, there was a very famous bank robber in the United States called Willie Sutton, and the famous... Legendary Willie Sutton story goes something like this. When he was finally captured by the feds, they took him out after sentencing, and he was uh, taken out in handcuffs in a perp walk in front of the press. And one reporter yelled out at Willie Sutton, and he yelled, him, uh, yelled at him, Hey, Willie, why do you rob banks? And you know what Willie Sutton's response was? Well, that's where the money is. Your money's in your inventory, and how you manage it, and how fast you can rotate it without missing business is absolutely everything to your financial performance as a retailer. Now, time and margin do go together, and it's called in this 
It's called GMROI, Gross Margin Return on Investment. Many years ago, I listened to an, a, a consultant give a speech in New York. He was from the South, actually. He had, a, he had a Southern accent. And he didn't call it GMROI. He kept calling it GIMROI. And he said, GIMROI is the way you look at your performance of inventory. It's how you look at vendors, how you look at store, and how you look at your inventory is through GIMROI. GIMROI is the answer. I kept thinking, who in the heck is GIMROI? Is that Billy Bob's cousin? But he was right. I used to work with a client on the, on the East Coast. They had 30 shoe stores. And they were a, uh, their parent company was H.H. H. Brown out of New England. And while I was working, this was back in the 90s, H.H. H. Brown was bought by Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett. And um, the first month, a team from Omaha went out to Baltimore and visited the CEO of the shoe chain, the small shoe, shoe chain. And one of the things they looked at is they looked at how they compensated or how they bonused, I should say, their management team. And I asked the CEO, and what happened was they tore it up in front of them. And he said, Warren Buffett's not going to. We don't bonus people this way. And I asked the CEO, well, how are you bonusing your store managers? And he said, well, we were bonusing them based on an increase in gross profit dollars over the course of the year. So if their store increased their gross profit dollars from the year before by 50000 they paid some sort of percentage of, say, maybe it was uh, 10%. So they got, the manager got a $5,000 bonus. And at, initially, I thought, wow, that's a, 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 why is that a problem? Why, Warren Buffett does not want to uh, 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 pay employees based on increases in profit dollars. And then I found out, no, no, he's fine with that. But our problem was we never attached the amount of capital investment that we had, had to put into the stores, uh, uh, the inventory, to the equation. So literally, you know, theoretically, the store manager, they had the option, could increase the inventory by $100 million and had $100 million tied up in the stock, but if their gross profit went up 50000 he or she would be rewarded. And that's what they put a stop to, because all bonuses were based on return on investment. Warren Buffett's an investor, and we have to include the capital of inventory that produced those sales. Let's take retail store comparison. Store A, sales were 500,000, small store, gross profit was 240,000, 48%. And store B, sales were the exact same, and the gross profit was 220,000 or 44%. If you were only using profit as your criteria, clearly store A is the best. Clearly, it made $20,000 more, the percentage was 48, store B was 44%. But we're missing the whole other factor, which is time. So let's say store A turned its stocks twice a year, but store B four times a year. That changes everything. And here's why. Store A had $240,000 in profit, but tied up on the average a cost inventory of $130,000, an ROI of $1.84. For every dollar tied up in inventory at cost, we had a return on investment of $1.84. Store B well, making a little bit less, only had 70000 tied up, $3.14. Think of it a different way. Think of it as that this is an investment. You bought a house. You and I bought a house uh, uh, next to each other 10 years ago. I paid $130,000 for my house. You paid $70,000 for yours. 10 years later, we both sell our houses at the, in the same month. You, I sold mine for two forty, dollars but you sold yours for two twenty. dollars who did a better deal? Who had a better return on investment? You did. And that's how you need to look at inventory, through that prism of GMROI. The other part of retail, of course, is initial markup, finding the right price. And I think far too many retailers do not really look at increasing initial markup as a way to improve their profits. But if I told you that you could increase your initial markup without any loss of business, without any tarnished, uh, tarnished image, would you do it? Yeah, you would, because it's important. Back when I started in retail, we had this thing called Keystone Pricing, which all we did was double the cost. And that was paid for merchandise. And that was the rule. And it was referred to as Keystone, which really isn't really used as often as it once was. Um, but why did we just double the cost? And why, where did Keystone markup come from? Where did, what did it mean? Um, you know, certainly doubling the cost would be easy. But I actually called the NRF and uh, years ago and asked them about it, and they said there was actually a, a key on old-timey registers uh, in the very early days of cash registers that would actually, if you hit the key, 
the K, it would then double the first calculator. It would double the cost price. Now, this practice predated individually ticketed items because pricing back in the 19th century was oftentimes handled right at the point of sale. Because prior to the end of the 19th century, Timothy Eaton in Canada pioneered a radical new concept called fixed pricing, not price fixing, fixed pricing, in which, and this was radical at the time, every item in the Eaton stores in Canada had a price on it because bartering before then was very common in retail. So when I ask retailers how do you come up with the price, I get lots of answers. I multiply the cost by 2.2, I double the cost and add a dollar, uh, they get mad, I, I, that's the way I always price it, why do you ask me these questions? But initial markup is meant to cover something. There are three key elements that has to be covered when you price goods. And you have to know about the first is we're going to take, if you're in the fashion business, uh, we're going to take markdowns. So what's an allowable markdown rate? What's our overhead cost as a percent to sales? These are all percent to sales. And how much money do we want to make? When we know those three, we can put those three elements that initial markup has to cover into a formula. And the formula looks like this. The IMU that you need equals markdown percentage plus operating expense percentage plus net profit percentage divided by 100% plus markdown percentage. This is the exact reason why I don't talk about formulas a lot. But if you put your numbers into the formula, you'll find out what you must have. For example, let's say we are markdowns, we allowable markdowns are 20% to sales. Our operating expenses are 40% to sales. And we want to make 6%. You put those numbers in the formula, and you get 55% as the percent of initial markup you must have, or we can't get the 6%. This is important. And when you look at the numbers this way, 52.5% with the same markdowns and the same expenses yields us 3%, but 55% on the right yields us 6 What's interesting about this slide is this. A 2.5% increase from 52.5 to 55 increases your net profit by 3%. It doubles it. And what that means is that for every dollar, penny, uh, lira, shekel, euro, uh, centavo, it doesn't, every one that we can increase by being just a little bit smarter and knowing where we can, goes right to your bottom line. So what would, what's 52.5% and 55% difference? Well. I'll just use an example, 52.5% is I paid $9 for it, and I marked it 19. But 55% is I paid $9 for it, and I marked it 19.99, or 19.90. Rule number one in retail, pricing. The customer always rounds down, always. There are plenty of gray in retail. This is black and white. 1990 or 19.99 is not $20 to the customer. It's 19 something. Every psychological study has done that. And by the way, initial markup can be small. The cents can add up to big dollars. An example of that is I fly again, Delta Airlines. Well, I was going through an audit about a year ago and I was looking at all the, the tickets I bought on Delta Airlines and I realized something that every ticket I bought that year ended in 20 cents. In other words, if I bought a ticket for $455, it wasn't $455, it was $455 and 20 cents. The 20 cents was completely irrelevant to me. And I would probably make the point that, that, that not one human being on planet Earth ever did not buy a ticket on Delta Airlines because of those 20 cents. But what did that mean to Delta Airlines, 20 cents? Didn't lose any business, no loss of image, no tarnished, nothing. They sold 180 million tickets that year times 20 cents. It's $36 million that they put on their bottom line because they could. And we need to think that way, too. We're not talking about big differences. We're talking about small differences that add up. And one of the best ways you can do this to get more market is steer clear of cost-based pricing. We're all guilty of this, cost-based pricing. What is that? We base the price on the cost. Now, this is where we don't, we're not into a situation of, of, of map pricing, we're not into a situation where maybe the competitors or it's readily available online. So, we, you know, uh, we have a lot of price transparency. This is where we can, where we can get away with it. And cost-based pricing simply goes like this. You and I are buyers together. We sit down, we see a widget. 
We look at the widget. We really like it. Nobody else carries it in the area. They're not going to shop it online. And we both say, oh, I think we should buy it. It looks great. You know what the next thing sample gate retailers do? They ask the salesman how much it is. That's where we go wrong. Instead of doing that, how much can we sell it for? And let's say you and I decide that that's a $49 item. We're going to market 49 And then you say, yeah, but Paul, let's market 49 50 because let's get the free cents price in there. So we market 49 50 We agree we can sell for 49 50 Now we ask the cost price. The salesman says 9 So if we knew the $9 initially, I, and you have to be honest with yourself, if you, they, <clears throat> you ask the $9 right away, and they said $9, you would have marked it twenty nine fifty, and thought you were stealing it. We would have, it would have been captured. The price that we put on that item would have been captured by the gravity of the cost. Just don't price based on the the intrinsic value of item, not based on cost. Now, one of a perfect example of that is I was giving a whole seminar on pricing, and afterwards my sponsors took me to lunch. And on the way back to the hotel, we walked by a high end wind store. And the owner came out. He saw me walking by. He was at my seminar. He said, Paul, I've already introduced your pricing concepts. I go, already? It's been 20 minutes. And he said, yeah, we got back. I got a bunch of Robert Talbot ties in the back, and my tie buyer was unpacking in the market room. And all the ties were marked $115. And I asked the tie buyer, how did you come up with $115? And he goes, well, that's what I always think. We'll mark it. And he goes, well, let's think about it for a while. Nobody in a high-end men's store, a luxury men's store, who's comparing price? at $159, because we would sell a tie with tie, shirt-tie combinations that we put on a suit a guy, a, a, a gentleman bought for $2,000, and then we would show them shirt-tie combinations. So why not 119 Why not 119.50? Why 115 And the reason why why not 119 is because we never even talked about it. We just did things the way they were. And now that he started to think about it, he goes, you know, if we mark him 119 $4 times how many ties they sell in a year, it's a pretty big number. So they changed it. The, the, the addendum to that story is a month later, he called me. And he said, i got to tell you a funny story. Their only other store in that community that carried that line was, in, was Nordstrom. We went up to the Nordstrom store, which was across town, and all the Robert Talbot ties were parked price 129 Lazy. Didn't think. Didn't care. It's important. Now, the other part of the initial markup is markdowns. Markdowns uh, can inspire fear in consumers' eyes. Uh, markdowns are a part of retail, and markdowns are a cost as real as any other expense that you have on your income statement. We just don't have to write a check for them. <clears throat> That's all. But they need to be controlled. And there are good markdowns, and there are bad markdowns. The good markdowns, we take markdowns to keep inventory fresh, recognize slow sellers. We take markdowns to get cash back so we can ensure good cash flow. And markdowns, as we pointed out, are simply a cost of doing business just like payroll. We need to know what the right cost is. The bad markdowns can be higher than any other expense on your income statement, including payroll, and they can be so high that they can raise the cost of goods sold to the point where we can result in a net loss. So what are those root causes of excessive markdowns? There's lots. Poor buying, bad styles, incorrect sizes, price points, buying minimums that are too large to absorb, duplicate items. I mean, go down the list. They can all be factors. But essentially, the one cause for excessive markdowns that supersedes all of these others is that we buy too much. Overbuying is going to cause cash flow problems. It's going to cause sales problems for a number of reasons that we've already talked about. And overbuying is the cause of excessive markdowns. You have to remember that if you're a women's store, but this is true for a lot of retailers, <clears throat> women's clothing, 90% of your sales come from inventory less than 10 weeks old. Now, we have to recognize the shelf life of our merchandise. We have to recognize slow sellers in, uh, uh, in season. Because all inventory, with the possible exception of gold or a really <coughs> fine cabernet, depreciates over time and has a shelf life. If we want four turns, then we've got, we have to learn to buy no more than what we can sell in three months. And markdown decisions need to take place within that defined time frame. And when we take markdowns, we have to understand that the lowest price doesn't always win the sale. Because, again, human beings are more likely to avoid a loss than seek a win. Money is good. Giving it up is bad. So anytime we can frame a sale around saving versus how much they're spending, 
then that is a positive. That's why when you go into these like grocery stores, and you get your receipt at the end of when you make your purchase, it'll say at the bottom a reminder how much you saved today because that's a positive. Saving good, spending bad. And by the way, anybody on the call that uh, uh, that are using percentage off, I want to give you some, some insight on that. You never see 20% off Diet Coke or 15% off okay toothpaste. You ever wonder why? There's a good reason why the packaged goods industry doesn't use percentage off incentives, while the rest of the retail world has gone percentage crazy. There's two drawbacks. The first is that you're asking the consumer to do a mathematical calculation, and even in the best of times, the average consumer is, well, let's say somewhat math challenged. And number two is, well, I often ask them when I give this in a seminar, in a, uh, in a live presentation, I ask if anybody here is on heroin. Everybody laughs, but the second drawback is that consumers develop an immunity or an addiction to percentage off, and it takes a higher and higher percentage to get them to act. Your body building tolerance to alcohol over time. The longer you drink, the longer you take drugs, the more it takes you to get intoxicated. The first hit's always the best. That's what they tell me, at least. That's why today, 20% off is deemed worthless unless it's applied to a product that rarely is discounted, like alcohol. And then finally, using dollar savings, not percentages. A $25 coupon has more motivation than a 25% off coupon because it's easier to grasp. And easy is what the consumer is looking for today. Make it simple for me is the new hook, especially if you sell higher or moderately priced items. A recent online survey tested the effectiveness of various email offers, and the customer chose $50 off a purchase as a reasonably good incentive that would still maintain sufficient margin. And using the same parameters, they picked 15% off offer because it was equivalent to the final price. I think you know how this is going to end. $50 off had 82% higher conversion rate and generated 270% more revenue because it meant more than the percentage off. So finally, I'm going to end this with some basic rules about markdowns that I want you to really take to heart. Number one, when you take a markdown, tell the consumer why. Why is it markdown? Don't put things on sale and just quit sale. It has to be a reason. End of season, discontinued item, whatever the reason is, tell them why. Because if you don't, then why would they believe any of your prices? Well, Bill, that this is all 20% off here. When's that coming down? Remember, the first markdown you take is the cheapest, not because the markdown is small, but make the markdown work. Again, time comes into play here. Your first markdown is the cheapest if it works. That may be that $115 tie, which is not as good looking when it arrived as we thought it was when we bought it. That may be in the first markdown, might be $49.90. Because the worst thing in retail is to walk into a store where they're being timid on markdowns, trying to maintain a margin. And, and a third of the store is all items marked down and but if the dress was 140, now it's 119. That's crossed out 99. That's crossed out 79. That's crossed out 40. That's the worst thing in retail. Avoid that. Be aggressive on your markdowns. And remember, price points and the amount saved, not percentages. Every time you take a markdown, learn from it. They're the tuition you pay for the education of your customer. Learn from the markdown so we don't make the mistake again. And not every retail, but there's one retail vertical that never discounts, ladies and gentlemen, and that is cosmetics. And cosmetics does something that's very, very important. They give away free stuff. And that's something we could all learn from because nobody likes free better than me. And customers, if you can give away little free gifts that are, that are meaningful to the consumer. I don't have, I'm running out of time on this webinar, but I have a lot of stories of how retailers do that very effectively. And it helps them with maintaining the customers, loyal customers, and it can cut their markdowns. So that ends the presentation. Uh, it was a little over an hour. I want to thank everybody. And if you're interested at all in retail pro planning, I would urge you to either co uh, contact Dustin or myself at all.retailpro at retailorbit.com. Love to chat with you about your business and how we might be able to help. And we also have a free inventory analysis. And I don't know, if Dustin, if you want to bring that up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you are a current Retail Pro user, we could easily do a retail um, a, or an inventory analysis for you in which we run a simple Retail Pro report from your Retail Pro system. We'll export it to Excel, and essentially Paul or someone from his team can look over your actual 
historical data for maybe the past year or two and give you some feedback and have a strategy session and explain um, exactly what the service could do for you um, or just have a Thanks. a uh, a you know a great discussion around your actual numbers Thanks Dustin I can I can tell you that if you choose to do this free inventory analysis I can almost guarantee you you will learn something about your business that you didn't know before that we can show you things about where where you could be doing it on your own or how we could help improve your cash flow, your profitability, and improve your sales. Your sales. So with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you, everyone, very much for joining. And keep an eye out for the recording. And have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.